All right, all right. Welcome to Mondo Market TV. Hi, I'm Scott Romick. I'm going to be your host today. And first things first, let's take care of a little uh, housekeeping here. So if you could share this on your Facebook page, that would do wonders for us. Now make sure that you press a, a thumbs up or a heart uh, but make sure that you share it. That lets the powers that be know that this is something that they want to send out there. So uh, what we're doing today, um, we are continuing our course on self-reliance, and that's why I have Cody McKendrick here from Salt City Brew Supply. Um, we're going to see what it's like and what it takes to make your own beer, which is something close to my heart. I really like beer, so this is a really exciting course for me. So, Cody, how are you doing today? I'm great. How are you? I'm fantastic. I'm so excited you're here. You know, I always <coughs> thought that this was such a complicated process that I wasn't really sure if it was something that, that I could do, but you put together some kits to make this so that anybody can do it. How did you get involved in, in the whole beer making thing and, and you know what made you put this kit together and, and get involved in this? Yeah, well, just like you, I was always a beer lover. Uh -huh. um, I, I thought beer was interesting and 10, 15 years ago when the craft beer movement uh, started really picking up steam in America, I, I started getting more into different beer styles and learning about them. And, um, and through another friend of mine, he shared with me how to make beer, and I started learning more about it, and it really sucked me in. It's the, it's the slipperiest slope in the world. <laughs> um, fast forward a few years from that, and we, uh, we turned it into, me and I have a, have a partner as okay. well, but we turned it into a, a full-time job. And so all day, every day, I, I help people make beer, help people make better beer, help people figure out what might have gone wrong in the process. And, it's, uh, there's, no, there's no boring days. It's always a good time. Wonderful. Okay. All right. So let's get right into this. We've got some, some kits here, but let's, let's talk a little bit about what we've got in front of us. Here. Sure. Um, so for, for your kits, what do we, what do we have? What do we, what do we use? And what's the process from, sure. from kind of uh, start to finish here? Yeah. Well, there's going to be ingredients for the beer itself, and there's going to be equipment you'll need to make the beer itself. Um, let's just briefly talk about what beer is made of, and then okay. we can go over how that can translate to what you can do at home. Good idea. So on a tiny scale or the biggest scale, beer is made from uh, generally malted barley. So malted barley would be something kind of like this right here. Um, it's just barley that they malt. It's just barley like a, a grain. They malt. Okay. And the malting process is where they get it wet and it starts to germinate. Perfect, right. Um, and as it starts to germinate, they dry it out. And what that does is it locks all these starches and enzymes inside of this um, that would be otherwise used for feeding that sapling, the okay. barley, from, to grow. All right. So to make beer from that, what they figured out years ago is that if you crush it and expose it to water at a very particular temperature, enzymes that are inside of this will convert the starch to sugar. Oh, okay. And then if you separate the grain from that liquid, now you have a really sugary liquid. Okay. Um, and if you ferment that out, it essentially makes beer. Okay. Um, so that's the science behind it, and it can be as complicated as you want, or it can be incredibly simple. And for home brewing, it's generally pretty simple. Okay, very um, good. So for home brewing, instead of using malted barley to get the majority of your fermented sugars, that process where they expose it to water is called mashing. The mashing's already been done for you. Oh, good. And so okay. now you have what's called malt extract, which is uh, generally in a syrup or a powder like this. Okay, let's uh, put that right down in this box right here. Okay. So it just kind of looks... That's a thick, that's a yeah. thick substance, right? Yeah, it's, it's a okay. consistency of honey, and it's very sweet. Okay. You can put it on your ice cream if you want. Okay. Um, it's like liquid malt balls. If you ever like Whoppers, same thing, just liquid okay. form of it. This is where the majority of your sugar that's going to turn into alcohol comes from. Okay. Um, from there, whether it's the lightest beer in the world, the darkest beer in the world, uh, it starts with a light base just like this. Okay. And then you use specialty grains that have gone through a secondary process, um, typically kilned or roasted to get different colors. Okay. Um, and you'll take some grains kind of like these. Uh, if you can kind of see, they're a little darker than the ones we used before. Uh -huh. um, and then you steep those in hot water. Because these have already gone through a heating process, the sugars are already caramelized. All you have to do is soak them in hot water to get all the goodness out of them. Okay. So you use different varieties of these to get different colors and flavors and aromas in the beer. Um, and, that's, and that's really all there is to it as far as the grain base goes. Okay. Um, from there, you'll, you'll boil the process. You have to boil the beer, um, and you typically boil it with hops. Uh, these are pelletized hops right here. They give the bitterness to, to beer. Um, without hops, beer would be fairly cloyingly sweet on the palate. So these provide a balancing bitterness to it, and then depending on how you use them and which ones you use 
will also provide different flavors and, and aromas to the beer. Okay, all right, very good. So once you've gone through that full boiling process with the hops, it typically takes about an hour, um, then you'll add your yeast, and the yeast will ferment through that sugar, create alcohol, um, which is one of the good things of beer for most people. Yeah. Um, and then you're ready to go. You can bottle it at the end. Okay. So from start to finish, you know, your, your brew day that like we go through here would typically take two to three hours. Uh -huh. And once you've brewed the beer, it's usually three to six weeks before you can drink it. Okay. And what, what's this right here? So that's a grain mixture for a specific type of beer. So okay. I brought some sample ingredients. These are some different specialty grains. One's called honey malt. Uh, one's called Crystal 10, um, and there's some white wheat in there as well. And these okay. would be uh, typical of a style of beer called a Kolsch. Okay, um, it's yeah. a German style of beer. In America, we'd call it a Kolsch style, but in Germany, yeah. they call it Kolsch itself. Okay. Um, and so these are just different ingredients I brought along to do a demo. Okay. So that would be the ones for that specific recipe. Terrific. Okay. All right. Beautiful. Now, um, we want to let you know that you get an opportunity. We've got two kinds of kits here. We have our basic kit and we've got a uh, super deluxe kit. Now you can get these kits at mondomarkettv.com. Now while, uh, in the next 24 hours, now this is the time to get it because you're gonna get a special price right now. So for the basic kit, it's only $80. And for the Super Deluxe kit, it's $159. So now is the time to get it uh, at these reduced prices during this 24 hours. And, you know, it looks to me, uh, from talking to Cody here, that this is something that even I could do. Um, you know, again, I, I always thought that beer making was really complicated, but Cody's put these kits together and made it so that it's gonna be really user friendly for everybody here. So yeah. um, do you wanna get into maybe some of the equipment yeah. here? Let's, let's start with that. What do we yeah. have here? So that's just a bottle brush. So you okay. use that to clean the actual beer bottles you're gonna bottle into near the end. Okay. Um, so it's just ha helpful for keeping beer bottles clean so you can keep reusing them. Okay. And that'll also help keep the cost down of the beer you're making. Okay. If you have to keep buying more bottles each time, um, it can get pretty expensive. Okay. Um, and a lot, one of, for a lot of people, one of the ideas of making beer is that you can do it at home, you can do whatever you want, and it's, a little, it's a, sometimes a lot less expensive than beer you buy. Okay, all right. And then uh, what is this? That's uh, just a basic stirring paddle. So okay. that's, that's one of the parts that comes in the Super Deluxe kit. Um, and so it just helps you dissolve in the malt extract when you're stirring it in uh, during your boiling process and uh, helps you stir in and mix up the, the water at the end. Okay. Things like that. Nothing, nothing too high tech about All it. All right. And what do we have here? This is uh, a low tech. Let me... It's called an auto siphon. So okay. for years and years, and when I started, it was you just have to siphon the. It's called racking, but you siphon the beer from one vessel to the next. Uh -huh. um, a lot of people would do a gravity fed siphon, um, which is a little finicky and can be not as sanitary. Okay. So this is an auto siphon, and, and the way it works is you'll essentially just. Uh, when you put this into the, the fermenter or the vessel you're transferring out of, you'll pull up on this racking cane. Oh, okay. It'll draw liquid, the beer, into this tube. And when you push it down, it forces the tube out the top end, or okay. the liquid out the top out end. The top and so end. it's a really easy and sanitary way to siphon things from one vessel to the next. And when I got my first one so many years into my brewing career, uh, it was like a light bulb turned on. Like, what have I been doing? This is way easier. <laughs> way, way easier. That All comes right. in both the basic and the deluxe kit. Okay, very good. And what do we have here? It looks like some kind of thermometer. Yep, just a right? basic, yep, exactly. Just a basic candy thermometer. They're nice. They're glass, which is really nice because they're easy to, to sanitize, which is important uh -huh. for beer brewing. Okay. Um, and they're very accurate. You just got to be careful with them because they are fragile. If you look at them wrong, they tend to break. Okay. So be careful we'll with watch them. Watch on that. All right. And what do we have here? And that's a bottle filler. Uh, so at the very end, uh, when you're ready to bottle your beer, you'll use that to do it. And so the way it works, it's got a little pin in the bottom. Uh, the beer will flow through it. When, it hit, when you hit the bottom of a bottle like that, the pin opens up and okay. the beer flows in. And when you pull it off, it stops the flow. So what's going from, what, how's that getting into there? Sure. So... Um, what we have over here oh, okay. are fermenters and bottling buckets. So okay. um, there's two buckets nested here. One's a six and a half gallon, just standard food grade fermenting bucket, which the majority of home brewers use. Okay. Um, most home brewing is done with a five gallon batch, and so that makes roughly 45 to 50 12 ounce bottles. Um, so you, 
So you need a bigger fermenter for that. So five gallons of beer would require about a six and a half gallon vessel to ferment in. Okay. The other bucket is a bottling bucket and it's gonna have a spigot on the bottom of it. Okay. Um, so when you're bottling, you'll transfer the beer with that auto siphon over to your bottling bucket and then a piece of tubing, just like you see here, will go from the spigot on the bottling bucket to here. And then you just and drain. And that's right here, right? No, the spigot's oh, gonna spigot's be, be drilled there. into one oh, of these okay. buckets. All it's right. just a regular, uh, spigot with a little hand valve on it. Super, okay. super simple. All right. Now uh, this looks interesting right here. Yeah. So that's a part that comes with the Super Deluxe kit. Uh, what it's used for, it's called a carboy brush. It's got a right angle on it. Okay. Um, these glass carboys over here, they're a little difficult to clean the inside of, and so uh -huh. that's designed to be able to get up into the shoulder and the neck of those carboys to all clean right. it. Well, it really comes with a lot of stuff here. Yeah, especially, I mean, the basic kit comes with all the basic stuff you need mm -hmm. um, other than a kettle, which a lot okay. of people have at home. You just sure. basically need a four gallon, 16 quart or bigger kettle. Okay. Um, if you have that, then the basic kit can get you started. Okay. The deluxe kit comes with a kettle and that comes with all the everything else as well. So it's gonna come with the carboy, uh, the, the carboy brush, comes with some sanitizer, which you have in your hand there. Okay, that's what this is right yeah. here. Yeah. Now this is just to make sure that everything's safe and clean, right? Yeah, and nothing can ever harm you in beer. You can't make beer that's gonna hurt you. But what happens is all the airborne bacteria and yeast that's around us or on mm. us, it'll also want to ferment that sugar. Okay. And it's just going to give you some undesirable flavors. Right. And so um, when, when you're finished with the process of boiling it, um, everything that comes in contact with your beer at that point needs to be sanitized. Okay, that makes sense. And then we have this here. Now, what is this? Now, this is Let's just move that out the, the world's most complicated simple device. Okay. It's called a hydrometer. Uh -huh. All it does is it measures the density of a solution. Okay, so it measures dissolved solids. So it's calibrated that with water at roughly room temperature, about 65 degrees, the liquid would cross that measurement at one. Okay. okay the more sugar you have dissolved in that solution, the higher it's gonna float. Oh. Um, so what you'll have in beer brewing is you're gonna have something known as a gravity reading. You'll have original gravity readings and final gravity readings. Uh, original gravity readings are going to be higher because you have all of your sugar present. And you'll take a reading, we'll say it's like 1.050. Um, after the, the yeast ferments the sugar and replaces it with alcohol, your final gravity will be a lot lower because alcohol is thinner than water. So your final gravity will be um, usually about 75% less than your original gravity. So if you start off at 1.050, you'll end up with roughly 1.015. And so it would technically sit, sink lower in the sample you take for that reading. These are, these are probably the most important instrument you have in brewing. Um, and it's a really good thing to get in the practice of using because it's gonna tell you anything that goes on inside of your fermentation. So it'll tell you how much sugar you started with and how much sugar you ended with, mm -hmm. which in turn will tell you how much alcohol you created. Okay. And if, for any, if anything happened in that process, say, a temperature change happened, like maybe your furnace went out and the temperature dropped in your house and your fermentation stopped. Um, the only way to know what's going on inside of your fermenter is by taking a reading with this. This is your window to everything that's happening. So it's a, it's a really simple tool to use. All you do is float it in your sample and then look where the liquid crosses it. Um, but a lot of people don't use it and then they run into a problem and call someone like me and be like, hey, you know, this is going on, what's going on with that? And all I can say was, well, what was your hydrometer reading and what is it now? And if you don't know, then all we can do is guess. Okay, that's okay. So that sounds like a really important part of yeah, the process. Yeah, yeah. It's as simple as what you see here. You know, okay. you just look at where the liquid crosses the the glass tube, and that's it. Okay. I mean, there's not not much else to it. All right. Well, as you can see, you get a lot of stuff with these kits. Now, again, during these next 24 hours, this is the time to make this purchase. Go to MondoMarketTV.com, and you're going to have the opportunity to purchase either the basic kit for $80 or the Super Deluxe kit for $159.99. So now is the time to do it because this is a great project and something that uh, would be really neat to know how to do. Uh, I know I have a, 
a brother-in-law that, that brews his own beer, and he just loves it. And whenever yeah. he comes around or we go out there, I get to try some of the different things that he's done. And it's always really neat, you know, whether you're, whatever you're making, if you get to share that, uh, that's what's really, really fun. And I think that's where people get, get really drawn into the hobby is that it's, every beer you make has its own unique story. You know, and as homebrewers, you don't have to worry about whether 10 million people across the country are going to want to buy your beer. Right. Um, all you have to wonder, all you have to worry about is whether or not you like your beer. Yep. And so you can make exactly the beer that you like, and then you could add anything that your brain can scheme up. You know, you can add lavender or coriander, different spices, different fruits, different types of honey, different sugars. I mean, there's so many different options you can get into. So when you give somebody your beer, you can get, tell them the story about it. Oh, yeah. you know, this is a pale ale, but I added, you know, grapefruit from my cousin's yard in, you know, Florida, and they sent them to us, and we added it to it and did it this way. And so every beer has its own story, and it's it's fun to share that with people. Absolutely, yeah. And so you can create some some really imaginative types oh. of of beer. I mean, yeah. I think most of us have all kind of grown up on the basics, and and. Uh, over the year, I mean, from when I was a, a young guy, um, but you know, as as people have gotten to experiment more and more with it, you can get some really interesting flavors out. Absolutely, there. and you can make beer every bit as good at home as you can buy commercially in the store, and and oftentimes better. Absolutely, I've I've had way better home brews um, than I've and I've had some pretty poor examples of beer commercially. I mean, I'm sure we've all had that experience, but. Yeah, there's, there's no limit. And the nice thing, again, about homebrewing is there's, there's room for everybody in it because it's such a simple, appro approachable hobby at its basic level. Um, it attracts people that really like to, like to cook and create recipes and, right. and really brainstorm these different ideas and flavor combinations. But it also attracts the more scientific types, you know, with the propellers over their head. And they like to get into the sure. science and microbiology and chemistry. And there is a lot of that there you can get into but you don't have to, Okay. you know, so everybody can have their own little take on it. It's a lot of fun. Right. It suits a lot of needs. Wonderful. All right. So if we were, if we were going through this, um, how would we kind of start it out? Yeah, it's great. Let me show you. This is going to be a little bit of an abbreviated brew session, but um, again, time-lapse photography. Yeah. Time -lapse. <laughs> through the power of the internet and TV, we can do this quickly. Right. Um, but really we're not, you're not going to miss out on anything because the majority of the time is just spent waiting for things and watching things boil. Okay. So we'll just be able to go through the steps just as easy as if you saw the whole thing, but it'll happen in a little bit less time. Okay. So the first thing you're gonna need is a kettle, like we talked about. This, this one's five gallons, but for typical home brewing, you need something that's roughly four gallons, 16 quart or bigger. Um, if you get much bigger than that, you might have a hard time getting it to boil on your, on your stove. Ah, okay. um, but people that do bigger batches will use outdoor patio burners and things like that to get to get everything boiling. Okay. So all I've got in here is about a gallon of hot water, um, but it's about 150 degrees. So the first thing you're gonna do to your hot water is you're gonna add your steeping grains. So these have already been prepared. It's just a mixture of those grains for a specific recipe. You're gonna add them into like a big sock or a, it's called a muslin bag. You can use nylon bags as well, but these are really easy and disposable. Um, let's see if I can do this without making a big mess. That looks like something I'd have over my leg if I had a cat. Yeah, you know, <laughs> that's the funny thing is the, the home brewing industry has really blown up in the last 20 years, and a lot of it's because of the internet makes information so available. Sure. When before that happened, everybody's like, oh, yeah, I've got a crazy uncle that brews beer in their bathtub and uses a pantyhose. And right. I guess from an outside observer, that might have been what it looked like, but there was probably something a little more sophisticated happening. Sure. Barely. <laughs> so basically, we add this grain to this giant tea bag. And then nice. you're just going to add it into this pot of hot water okay. and just kind of make that tied off so you can get to it. And this is going to steep for 30 minutes. Um, the temperature is going to be between 140 and 160 degrees. It's not super technical as far as what, or too super specific, excuse me, about what temperature it's going to be at. Um, so would you have like a, a thermometer testing it every once in a while to make sure it's not getting too hot? Or, or once you get it to a certain spot, don't touch anything, it should stay about the same, it's, right? You know, because these are the specialty grains, the ones that make, um, give it color and flavor, and mm -hmm. they've already gone through a, a crystallization process with okay. heat, 
all you have to do is steep them in warm water and okay. it's soluble. So it's okay. not that particular. It's not a, not a panic thing if it's nope. five degrees nope. here, 10 degrees there or whatever. Nope, as you get into more intermediate brewing processes where you're brewing with all grain and doing that mash, okay. then it is more specific. Gotcha. But for this, I mean, you can heat your water up to 160, add your grains, throw the lid on just to keep some heat on and walk away. You know, okay. Maybe you need to pour another beer for yourself sure. or something. Yeah. But at this point, you have nothing to do for 30 minutes. Okay. Okay, so let's fast forward 30 minutes. Okay. You know, you're, as you can kind of start to see, some of the sugars are starting to come out of this bag, and so uh -huh. you're getting some color. Um, so what we'll do after 30 minutes, we're gonna pull this bag of grain out. You wanna let it drain. You wanna get as much of that sugary liquid out of it as you can. Um, but you don't want to squeeze it. Squeezing no, it. I was just going to ask that. Yeah. yeah. So it's a, it's a, it would have been a, would have been a good question, but yeah. I beat you to it. Yeah. <laughs> um, squeezing it can force some of the tannins out of the husk of the grain, and the husk tannins are a little bitter and a different type of bitter that you're used to in beer. So you just want to let it drain. If you wanted to, you could pour some hot water through it to rinse it, but it's not too big of a deal. Okay. Um, and then you just discard it. Now this grain can do a lot of things. It can, you can make spent grain bread out of it, which is delicious. You can make dog treats. You can compost it. Can I hold that for you? Absolutely. All right. Prevent me from making a mess, electrocuting all of us. Right. And uh, there we go. Or you can just throw it away. Um, I always recommend trying to repurpose things. So I've made sure. some pretty good spent grain bread. If you're into bread making, it's, it's really nice to nice. do. So now we have this kind of grain tea sitting here. Uh, the next thing we do is we're going to add our malt extract. Okay. Um, malt extract, like we talked about a minute ago, can come in this liquid form like a syrup. Okay. This would be called LME, or liquid malt extract. There's also a powdered version of it called DME, or dried malt extract. They're interchangeable. Okay. So this particular recipe, we're just going to use the liquid. Okay, now how much of this... Uh, if I was using this whole bag, how much would that make? Uh, this makes five gallons. Five gallons, yep. right there. And, okay. and the amount by weight you use is going to dictate how much alcohol you're going to create. Okay. So every every pound of liquid extract gives you about 0.7% alcohol okay. in a five-gallon batch. Okay. So this is seven pounds right here. Just this alone is going to give us about 4.9 or 5% alcohol. Good. Good. Um, there is some variability there depending on the yeast you use, but okay. it's, it's real close. Okay. Um, so... A couple things you can do if you soak this in some warm water before you get started, it'll help kind of thin it out so it's not such a dense liquid. Okay. Um, but typically you just, mm, I'll do it this way. Open it up. Now come on. And start. Now, when you do this, you want to make sure you're not on the heat because you don't want this stuff to scorch to the bottom. So turn your burner off or take it off the burner and then start stirring this in. So we're only going to do a part of it just for t sake of time. We'll do about that much. T if we were doing the full recipe in the full amount of time, we would add it all. Okay. All right. I'm making a mess. Okay, let me take that for you. See, normally I would have a sink next to sure, where I yeah. could wash my hand off, but I've got this towel right here. It'll oh, perfect. Fine. Yeah, good deal. So, all right, so then we're just going to stir it all the way in. I want to make sure all of that syrup is dissolved. Okay. It's sweet, huh? It is sweet, yeah. Yeah. So that gets dissolved in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Once it's dissolved in, we're just going to turn the heat back on and bring it to a boil. Okay. All right. So that's pretty good right there. I mean, I'd probably stir a little more, but I'm sure this isn't super interesting watching a pot stir <laughs> up. Okay. So now we're going to bring it to a boil. Um, I can turn the heat on here, but it'll probably take yeah. a few minutes to get going. So let's... Uh, while it's heating up, you can put the lid back on. Again, get yourself another beer. Sure. It's really important to have beer available while you're brewing beer. Uh, yeah, anytime it you're cooking. Makes yeah. process more yeah, exactly. <laughs> it makes the process more enjoyable, right? <laughs> so get get a bottle of your last brew, a batch of home sure, brew. Right. All right, now we're boiling, okay? okay so we're boiling. Um, once you're boiling and it's a good rolling boil. So you want to make sure it's a nice rolling boil. Okay. And you're gonna add hops. Now hops again are 
are the flowers of a climbing vine. They're very, they're very ornate and very aromatic, and they have different flavor characteristics. Um, but the important thing about them is they have something called alpha acid content. And I don't know if you can see it here. This type of hop specifically is called tetanang and has 3.7% alpha acid. What that percentage means is the bittering potential of the hop. Okay. So the higher the percentage is, the more bitterness that will give you. Okay. So a good example is a hop like this, 3.7 is pretty low. Um, if you had a hop that was, say, 16 or 17% alpha, it would take almost five ounces of this to get the same bittering effect as one ounce of the other hops. Okay. So when you're, when you're adding bittering hops, um, typically you'll pick some that have higher alpha value, so that way you don't need as much of it. And again, you can save some money on not buying five ounces of hops. Very good. All right. So what you're going to do is your, your, your recipe will have a specific boil schedule. Um, it'll tell you when to add your hops and how okay. much. So this particular recipe, let's just say it needed a half of ounce. This is a half ounce of those same hops right here. Okay. So you need a half ounce at the beginning for 60 minutes. So we're just going to add them into this other bag, just like the last one. Okay. I'll get it all the goodness in there. Okay. So we add it into that bag, and it goes into the boil, and then just kind of loosely tie it off to the handle of your kettle. Um, so, and then you start a timer. Now let's say we have another hop addition in 30 minutes. So I'd start a 30 minute timer. And again, go to the fridge, get another homebrew. Okay, so this right here, and not to overlook the importance of that. Sure. But now this one's going to be at a, at a rolling boil? Yep. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna boil it for a total of an hour. Okay. okay. So we'd start a timer. Um, I always set my timer to the next boil uh, hop addition. Okay. So if we had one at, at 30 minutes in the middle, okay. I would start a timer and set it for that and then I'd have one maybe 15 minutes later, which would be 45 minutes total through the okay. boil. Maybe add one there. That's going to be more of a flavor addition. Okay. And then maybe at the end, another 15 minutes later, so a total of 60 minutes, those would be aroma hops. They wouldn't give you much bitterness, but they'd give you more of like the aromatics of right. the Right, which is important, how it, how it smells. Yeah. You know, especially if you're not just drinking it straight from the bottle, right? I mean, you can sure. really get that. Absolutely. That's all part of your senses with the taste yep. and yep. The, yep. the visual aspect of it as well. And, that, and that's hop aroma. You know, there's certain beer styles specific. Uh, I mean, lots of beer styles that aren't, don't typically have much hop aroma. You know, a beer style like an IPA, Indian Pale Ale, would have a lot of hop bitterness and a lot of hop flavor and a mm -hmm. lot of hop aroma where, <clears throat> excuse me, where a, a beer style like a German wheat beer or a Hefeweizen generally would not have any hop aroma or really much of any hop flavor. Okay. You know, that beer in particular has a lot of yeast characteristics. Okay. And then you have beers like a, like a stout, you know, a real dark roasty beer. You know, the roasted malts are the star of that beer. Then generally the hop and the yeast characteristics aren't going to be very prominent. Okay. Uh, so that's the marriage between the hops and the yeast and the grain that's how you create different beer styles. Um, and just like cooking, the more you start to interact with different ingredients and you start smelling different hop varieties, mm -hmm. tasting different grains, um, and using different yeast strains, you'll start to pick up um, different flavors you weren't even noticing in beer. And then, you know, I remember the first one for me, I was brewing some different beers and I used a hop called Cascade, which is a really, it's the, it's the most common American hop. It has kind of a grapefruity, piney characteristic. And I, you know, I'd smell it. I'm like, oh, it smells like grapefruit. And I brewed beer. I'm like, oh yeah, you know, it tastes. I can taste that smell and that beer I just made. Uh -huh. And then a couple weeks later, I bought a Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. Mm -hmm. And and all of a sudden, that Sierra Nevada Pale Ale didn't just taste like a normal hoppy pale ale. It tasted like Cascade hops. Okay. And so from then on, I could start to pick out different flavors and, and layers and nuances and beers I was drinking. And it it really sucked me in at that point. I was like, oh. You know, there's so many things I can do. And that's, and that's one of the things that's great about these kits is that you can, you know, because I don't like everything about every kind of beer yeah, I drink. Yeah. And so you can say, you know, I like this one because it's sort of a, a, a more of a blonde, a lighter flavor to it. But I like just a little bit of bitterness over here and maybe, you know. And yeah. so you can kind of pick and choose and find out, you know, uh, what's that beer that's going to just be that, yeah. that, that perfect one for you. Yep. And then go on from there and, and keep creating different kinds of beers, right? Absolutely. Oh. And, and sometimes you don't, sometimes you have an idea and maybe it doesn't work out or maybe you use a new hop variety yeah. and it doesn't work out. At least then you know, 
yeah, I don't like that. You know, right. I, don't, I don't like tomatoes, but I wouldn't know that if I hadn't eaten a tomato once. That makes sense. Um, and somehow people think tomatoes taste good. It's strange to me. <laughs> okay. um, but yeah, I mean, same, same premise. You know, certain right. hop varieties or yeast varieties maybe you don't like and you just know to avoid those. So over time, you'll make better beer not only because your technique and understanding is better, but also because you're more aware of the types of beers and ingredients that you like. Yeah, I mean, I, for me, it's, it's uh, you know, I, I don't, it's what I don't know yeah. out there that could be the, the great things that, uh, that I really yep. enjoy. Yep, and having equipment kits like these, it gives you all the hardware you're going to need to brew any type of beer you could possibly fathom. Um, and then from there, you just need to buy, buy ingredients, and there's lots of places to get it. Um, the Mondo Marketplace, we'll have some. Yeah, we'll have some available mm -hmm. for you there. Um, now, so yeah, really all this equipment is stuff that you can just use. Once you get it, you can just use it over and over yeah. again. There's no reason to actually really buy, unless you're getting to maybe a different style yeah. um, or you're getting more technical. This basic kit and the Super Deluxe kit gives you really everything that you need to make beer going forward. Yeah. And really then after that, you're just figuring out what combinations that you like. Yeah, the Super Deluxe kit in particular comes with everything in the box on the hardware side you're gonna need to make beer. Um, at, if you want to, you can start purchasing additional fermenters mm -hmm. and that'll give you more capacity mm -hmm. so you can have multiple batches going at once. And that would make sense too if it takes four to six weeks, right? right. Yep. So you can start one and boom, boom, and maybe every month you've got a new yeah. one coming out, right? Yeah, so what'll happen, uh, and specifically with that um, super deluxe kit, you'll start your fermentation in one of the buckets. Mm -hmm. It's going to ferment in there for about a, a week or so. Um, after that, the yeast will essentially fall out. You'll siphon it off of the yeast sediment okay. over into this, what they call a secondary carboy, right. where the beer can continue to clear and mature. Mm -hmm. What that'll also do is open up your other fermenter for another batch. Boom, there so that you go. super deluxe gives you the capacity for twice as much beer at okay. one time, too. Okay, very good. All right. Beautiful. Okay, so what's the next process here? Okay, so let's say we boiled through, did all our hop additions, we boiled for an hour. Um, now at this point, it's extremely forgiving. You actually would have to go way out of your way to figure out a way to mess it up entirely. I like the sound of that. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, and if you drank one too many home brews and you're not sure if you used one hop or at the wrong time, okay. if you still added stuff in there, it's still gonna make beer and maybe okay. your, your on-the-fly adjustments made a better beer. There's really yeah. no way to know until okay. the end. So we've gone through an hour boil. We have this really hot, sugary petri dish that's sterile because it's been through the boiling process. Now what you want to do is you want to cool it off to below 80 degrees. Okay. And so what most people will do is take the lid. When you're boiling the beer, it's important to boil with the lid off. Um, you want to put the lid on and then take the, the kettle and put it into a sink full of ice and water. Okay. So you can tip. use a big uh, kitchen sink or if you don't have one large enough, you could use Cooler, like a, you could put yeah, it in the cooler. Yeah, the grandpa's bathtub, sure. back to that story, right. you know. Yeah. I used to use a, a Tupperware, a big plastic Tupperware that I had. But you wanted to just surround it with ice and water and keep rot or circulating water around it. Um, cooling it off will take another probably 30 or 40 minutes. Okay. Once it's below 80 degrees and you take your temperatures with a thermometer like this and make sure your thermometer is sanitized, at this point everything that comes in contact with your beer, which is called wort now, um, everything that comes in contact with the wort needs to be sanitized. So you should have mixed up some sanitizer. I usually put them in a spare bucket, okay. mix up the sanitizer that comes in the kit. Um, you can sanitize everything, take a temperature reading. You're below 80 degrees, that's great. Um, once you're there, then you want to take some of your sanitizer, pour it in your fermenting bucket, shake it up, pour it out. Um, it's a surface sanitizer, so once a surface has been contacted for uh, two minutes, just pour out the excess and you're sanitized. Okay. Then take your beer and you can pour it directly into your sanitized fermenter. Okay. Um, and then you want to top it up to five gallons. And the buckets have graduations on them, so it's really easy. You just use cool water. Okay, so you're topping it off with water. Yep. Okay. Um, right. So the beauty of, of extract brewing is you can do, you can condense all the sugar into a smaller boil amount. Okay. So you could boil two and a half gallons or three and a half gallons you're gonna use the same amount of sugar, the, the malt extract. Okay. But when you top it up to five gallons at the end, it all evens out. Okay, very um, good. So top it up to five gallons. Um, from there, the last thing you do is you're gonna add your yeast. So you'll take your yeast, if it's a dry yeast package, you'll just sprinkle it on top. Uh, if it's a liquid yeast, you just pour it in. Okay, and, and we're just talking about yeast that you get at the grocery stores, or is no, a special kind of yeast? it's a very specific kind of yeast. Okay. I mean, you could pitch bread yeast in there, but you wouldn't like what it tastes like. Yeah, okay, that sounds good to me. Um, so the what yeast, kind of yeast is it? Is it the, a 
Uh, it's brewer's yeast. Brewer's it's called yeast. Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Survey Okay. Um, and it's it's designed to produce beer. You know, okay. it's it's honestly probably cultured through many generations from from isolated wine yeast they found on grapes and whatnot. Okay. But over centuries, it's been specialized and mutated and cultured and taken care of, and now it's really awesome beer yeast. Okay. Um, so beer yeast will consume those sugars. It'll produce different. Um, you know, fermentation-derived characteristics. We'd call them esters or phenols. If you've ever had that German Hefeweizen that mm -hmm. has the, the clove and banana characteristics, uh -huh. those are esters and phenols from the yeast. Okay. But there's some yeast that don't produce very many at all, and it would be a very clean fermentation, um, like a lager. Okay. Lager yeast ferment colder, so they're real clean, don't have any of those yeast-derived characteristics. Okay. So the recipe you get, whether you buy a kit that's all together, or whether you find a recipe on the internet or put it together, um, you just need to buy a yeast appropriate for that style, and the kits come with the yeast. Oh, perfect. So, or the, okay. the ingredient kits will come with the, okay. with the particular yeast for that okay. beer. Good. Um, so you'd add the yeast in, put the sanitized lid, you'd sanitize your lid, put it on the top of the bucket, and then take your airlock. Um, you'd, there's a fill line, it's kind of hard to tell, but there's a line right here. You'd add your sanitizer up to that fill line, and then you'd put it into the hole on the bucket. There's a hole drilled to that bucket lid. Okay, and so that would look like that. Yeah. So what that airlock will allow is the CO2 from fermentation to escape the bucket okay. without air getting back in. Okay. Because right. air, air is your worst enemy. Once fermentation finishes, air is your worst enemy. Okay, how come? Because um, not only does it contain airborne bacteria and yeast, you want to avoid that exposure, but also um, it causes, I mean, the easiest way to describe it is like a staling effect. Okay. Um, oxidized beer, wine, if you've ever had the misfortune of trying one, it kind of tastes like wet paper or wet mm. cardboard. Okay. And so whenever, once your fermentation starts, you want to limit exposure to oxygen. And you do that by either keeping the bucket sealed or every time you transfer it, make sure you transfer it with a siphon. Okay. Um, you don't want to pour it from one vessel to the next because right. that's going to splash it and introduce oxygen, which, okay. which is what you want to avoid. Okay. And again, on the sanitizing thing, that's really important because it, the, the yeast will try to do, no matter what it is, yeah. no matter what, you know. Yep. Okay. And that's where beer and wine came from. I mean, they created some sort of sugary liquid, you know, one way or the other and let it sit out. And airborne yeast, you know, inoculated that that sugary liquid and fermented the sugars. And to this day, many fermentations, especially in Europe, still will pump the beer into these large flat vessels they call cool ships. Mm -hmm. And then the ambient air, local air, will just come across it to cool the beer off. And then the yeast falls in it that way and they pump it off to their fermentation tanks. Oh, be darn. And huh. so the, the cool, unique varietals of beer that came from Europe especially, right. you know, German Kolsch and, you know, the alt beers and different things like that, they were made with the ingredients and yeast that was unique to that region. Okay. And so, you know, they had a specific grain they grew there and a specific type of hop that grew nearby, and then the yeast was just what was airborne there. And now we've cultured those yeasts and they're available anywhere to brew with. So if you nice. want to brew a German Kolsch, you can buy a, the strain of yeast you get in Köln, Germany and make that beer. Pretty cool. Yeah. All right. So now with these ingredients here up mm -hmm. front, is this just a version of what you had in there, or is exactly. that something that you would add to it later? Well, those are just a display, just an example of different okay. types of grains that are okay. available. You know, there's, pro there's over a hundred different types of specialty grains, okay. and the specialty grains are going to be the ones you just need to steep in hot water. They give the beer different colors and flavors. Um, now, when we say grains, do we mean barley, or is that different? Uh, what is barley? Barley is a grain. Is, is a grain, And right? that's okay. generally the more, most common grain in beer okay. making. But uh, again, back to that German Hefeweizen or even American wheat beers, those are typically up to 70% wheat. Okay. Um, you can use rye in brewing. You can use oats. You can use corn, rice. I mean, the, the light American lagers like Budweiser have a ton of rice in them. Okay. Um, some of them use a lot of corn, which gives it kind of a, a viscous mouthfeel and a okay. corn sweetness in them. So there's lots of different types of grains that can be used, but the majority of beer is based off of barley. Now, I, I'm sure you get this question a lot when, when you have people coming into you asking, mm -hmm. asking about uh, beer making. 
you're starting to see out there some some gluten free beers. Mm -hmm. What's the what's the story behind that? How do they how do they manage that? Yeah, so barley. So if somebody wanted to do this at home, they could they could get the ingredients to do that as well, right? They they could. And there's a couple ways you can approach it. Okay. Um, gluten free is becoming a big industry. You can brew from grains that are. Um, naturally gluten free, mm -hmm. you know, so things like corn and rice and okay. sorghum, tapioca, millet, buckwheat, there's, there's a handful of them. They're a little harder to get your hands on, um, but it would make a, a beer, a fermented grain based beverage from those that's gl naturally gluten free. Um, they would be, they have different characteristics than beer you're probably used to. Sure. For better or worse, there's actually some people that tend to prefer that, and that's fine, that's awesome. Yeah. Drink what you enjoy. Yeah. Um, there's also a new enzyme that's available. It's called Clarity Firm. It's available okay. to commercial breweries or on the homebrew scale. Okay. Um, and you add it when you add your yeast. And Clarity Firm breaks down the proteins that are gluten. Um, and so it'll make a gluten reduced beer. And if it's 100% barley based beer, which mm -hmm. lots and lots of beers are, sure. it's typically below 10 parts per million. Okay. Um, that's safe for most people, but obviously everybody's own sensitivities are sure. there in play and sure. consult your doctor before drinking one right. of those beers. Right. But you can generally make a very, very gluten reduced beer uh, with just adding that enzyme and it would taste just like any other beer you would ever buy. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. Very good. All right. So we're, we've got this in here and it's six weeks later. Yeah. So. Or maybe there's a process there. Yeah, I'm no, missing, yeah. no, you're great. You yep. know, you can do with the basic kit. You would just do what they call a single stage fermentation. Okay. So you'd basically just forget about it. You want to let it sit for any ale, um, which is a lot of beer styles. Ales would be anything from an amber ale, an IPA, a half of Eisen, okay. stout, so on and so forth. Um, room temperature is great. So 62 to 70 degrees. It's going to ferment for about a week, and you'll notice that because the airlock will be bubbling, kind of percolating. Okay. After that, it's going to stop, and your natural tendency is to be like. Well, I want to drink this beer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's best to wait. Patience okay. is a virtue. And I would probably let it sit about three weeks. Okay. After three weeks, um, you can transfer it to your bottling bucket. So the yeast will have consumed all the sugar it can. You can verify that with your hydrometer reading. So open that fermentation vessel up, sanitize. I use a glass measuring cup with a handle. Take a sample, pour it in your hydrometer test jar, just like pour it in there, and get a reading from it. Okay. Um, if it, your, your recipe should have a final gravity number on it. Okay. If it's real close to that, like, like within a point or two, you're good to go. Okay. If it's off by more than a point, um, probably want to give it another day or two and test it again. Okay. If it's moved, you want to wait another day or two again and test again. Okay. The idea is you want to have two stable readings. Oh, okay. So All once right. you have two stable readings, then and you it's know what's done. Finished. And the, the reason that's important is that if you were to bottle that beer before it's finished fermenting, um, when you add the priming sugar, which is a measured amount of sugar that's going to be consumed by the yeast in the bottle to okay. give it ferment to give it carbonation. Oh, if, I was going to ask about that. Yeah. 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 So if you add the priming sugar plus there's residual sugar in your beer that hasn't fermented, mm -hmm. um, you'll you'll get some bad results. I mean, best case scenario, uh, you just have really overcarbonated beer okay. that when you open the cap, it's going to gush. It kind of okay. shoots out. Worst case scenario, and it is an absolute extreme worst. It doesn't happen very often, but you'll call what we. We make what we affectionately call bottle bombs, okay. <laughs> and those are pretty violent. A bottle bomb can embed glass into drywall. Okay. So it's really important to make sure your, your fermentation's finished. 99% of the time, it's going to finish just fine on its own. It's a very rare occurrence that that would ever cause a, a bottle bomb. Um, but anyways, you want to make sure your beer is finished. After that, you transfer it to the bottling bucket. You'll dissolve in that priming sugar that came with your recipe. Um, and then you'll bottle it off okay. and let that sit in the bottles capped. These kits come with a capper. Yeah, I was going to ask you what that yep. was. That was one thing we didn't. Yep, really so this is a at. capper. You'll just basically put a cap on a bottle, put, it, put this on it, and you're capped. Okay. You go through and cap all the bottles. You leave them at room temperature, usually about one or two weeks. I give them about a week because I'm impatient. Right. Throw one in the fridge, try it. If it's carbonated and good, all is well. Okay. If it's still a little sweet or undercarbed or just doesn't taste quite ready, Give it another week or two and try another one. Okay. Um, but you know, beer when it's young will have a very characteristic harshness. We call it as a beer judge, we call it kind of green or young beer. Um, and then all of a sudden, over the course of like a day or two, it'll just turn. Okay. And all of a sudden, it's great. Now let me ask you: when you when you you're, you're done with the process, you you've got the beer. It's it's sitting. Mm -hmm. How long um, can that beer? last yeah. in there and then is it going to extend time or shorten time if you keep it in the refrigerator? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, keeping it in the fridge will absolutely slow down the maturing process. Okay. And that's 
either good or bad depending on the beer. So generally, the higher the alcohol beer, the more time that beer takes to mature. So okay. if you made, say, a 12% imperial stout, okay. it'll still ferment out and be ready to bottle in three or four or five weeks, but that beer won't taste its best for probably six or nine months. Really? So, yeah, so a lot okay. of people will brew big imperial stouts or big really malty high alcohol Belgian beers like the Dubels and Chappelles, sure. Dark Strongs. They brew those in January to have available for Christmas. Nice. Um, a beer like a Hefeweizen, which is another good example of, another, of a beer that would be the opposite side of the spectrum. So a Hefeweizen, at two or three weeks, they're traditionally drank very young. They want that fresh yeast characteristic to be there. Um, over time, the freshness of that yeast will start to fade off, mm -hmm. and a six-month-old Hefeweizen probably wouldn't, won't taste, it won't taste as good as it was when it was fresh. Okay. So some beers will age for the better, some beers age for, for worse. It just What's, depends a little bit. What, what would you, if, let's say I'm, I'm, I'm doing this, I'm impatient, yeah. what kind of beer do I want to make yeah. that I'm going to be able to drink the soonest? If really good beers to start with are those Hefeweizens, yeah. um, American Pale Ales, or, okay. or British Bitters are really good because they have some hop character that can tend to hide some of the imperfections of a young beer. Um, Stouts and browns and porters, those are all really forgiving beers. I mean, okay. whether it's dark or light doesn't make them any easier or dark, harder to make. It's all the same. Um, just the, the really, really light beers, like a blonde ale or a cream ale, maybe avoid for your first batches just because there's not a lot for any imperfections to hide okay. behind. Yeah, yeah. And then anything higher alcohol. You know, it's really easy to make a high alcohol beer. You just have more fermentable sugar. Sure. But if you drink it at six weeks old, it's going to taste like a shot of Everclear's in it, oh, which okay. maybe you like. I don't yeah. know, but you know, in six or nine or twelve months, they they'll be substantially better. Okay. And some of the big examples, I mean, people will cellar those beers for many years. Wonderful. Several years. All right. Okay. Well, are there any last things that you'd like to say about these kits before we sign off? No, I mean, I'll go over really quick just the okay. difference in the two packages if Let's that do helps that. for people. Yeah. Um, the basic kit's going to come with the two buckets. So one's a fermenting bucket, one's a bottling bucket. It's going to come with a siphon. You need to transfer it from one to the next. It comes with a b all the stuff you need for bottling. So a bottle brush, a bottle filler, and a bottle capper. And then it comes with some basic cleaner and some tubing. Okay. Um, and, a, and a capper, I suppose. Okay. And, the, the, and this is the cleaner here? This uh, is the, that's, just, that's a sanitizer. That's a sanitizer. So it comes a sanitizer as well okay. for that kit. Um, the deluxe kit comes with all of that same stuff, but what okay. it's going to add is it's going to add um, the carboy, a carboy stopper, the carboy brush. Um, it comes with a thermometer at that point. Uh, and what about this thing right here? Does that come with that? Both or? kits will come with that. Okay, yeah. very good. Um, so the, the carboys are the, is really the big add on there. It's going to expand your capacity and give you some more options down the road. Um, a lot of people, some people don't use them, some people do. It just kind of depends on personal preference. But eventually, if you brew long enough, you're probably going to want one of these anyways. Sure. So it's, if you buy the whole package, you get a better deal. And then that deluxe on top of all of that comes with a kettle, a five gallon okay. kettle. All right, and then they're going to be able to get all the ingredients that they need uh, on Market Mondo TV as well, right? Yep, yep. Okay. We'll get some we'll get some kits get up some on there. Get some kits together. Yeah, okay, absolutely. very good. All right, so right now is the time to get this and order it now at Mondo MondoMarketTV.com. So it's going to give you an opportunity to have your choice of these two kits at a reduced price: the basic kit at eighty dollars, the super deluxe at one fifty nine ninety nine. Cody, it's been great to, uh, to speak with you about this. You've aligned, you know, taken away some of the, the insecurities and, sure. and uh, you know, uh, challenges that I thought that were out there. You've made this process so easy. Um, I'm really excited to give it a try. Yeah, well, there's, there's a lot of things that can be involved, but when you do it firsthand, your first time, you realize how simple it is, and yeah. it's like the light bulb goes on. I'm like, yeah. well, that wasn't hard at all. Right. Um, just you just don't get twisted around trying to figure out the the goofy vocabulary with beer. Cool. All right. Okay. So that's it for today. We're just going to let you just before we go. Uh, just want to remind you that uh, we're going to be doing the same place, uh, same time tomorrow. We're going to be doing another show on how to needle felt animals. So. Uh, for, for Mondo Market TV, this is Scott Romig. Have a great day, and we'll see you soon.